Item number, SCP-237. Object class, safe. Special containment procedures. The recovered components of SCP-2371 have been individually shrink-wrapped and are to be stored separately. Laser grids are established around each component to detect any incipient signs of activity. The individual instances of SCP-2372 are contained in separate proportionally reduced humanoid containment cells, with supervised interaction between instances being permitted contingent on good behavior. Personnel supervising interactions between instances of SCP-2372 are required to be fluent in spoken Japanese. All interactions are to be recorded and filmed. Instances of SCP-2372 will periodically request supplies of resin and clay with which to repair damage to themselves. To de-incentivize self-harm and prevent stockpiling, these requests are to be fulfilled no more often than once a month and any supplies not used in repairing damage are to be removed. Standard data mining bots have been introduced into the law enforcement IT infrastructure throughout the Kansai region of Japan to maintain surveillance for uncontained instances of SCP-2372. Standard internet monitoring bots have been set to watch video sharing sites for further copies of SCP-2371's videos. All such copies are to be taken down via Prenda protocols. Description SCP-237 is the collective designation of the physical remains of SCP-2371 and of the set of instances of SCP-2372 which it created. Prior to being taken into Foundation custody, SCP-2371 appeared to be a human male of Japanese ethnicity, with falsified identity documents indicating an age of 24 years. It manifested the anomalous ability to endow instances of SCP-2372 with sapience, sensoria, and independent mobility. The 16 instances of SCP-2372 are clay and polyurethane statuettes, which were anomalously given awareness, sight, hearing, and independent mobility by SCP-2371. 14 of the instances have displayed the ability to speak Japanese. Of these 14, three have also displayed the ability to speak English. While the massive time gap precludes a direct connection, Similarities with SCP-2101 suggest that these anomalies may descend from the same anomalous sculpting tradition. While being transported to Site-12 for long-term containment, SCP-2371 abruptly collapsed into several dozen disconnected slabs of clay and polyurethane resin, similar in composition to the instances of SCP-2372. However, where the resin and clay mixture in instances of SCP-2372 is homogeneous and featureless. In SCP-2371, the mixture is shaped into replica human organs that are accurate to the sub-millimeter level. List of instances of SCP-2372 in custody. 1. 23 centimeter tall human female in French maid's outfit, holding a deck broom. Non-removable. 2. 19 centimeter tall human female in swimsuit, has feline ears, one broken, tail, broken, and paws. 3. 25 centimeter tall human female in leather motorcyclist gear, with a zipper open past its navel, left forearm missing. 4. 27 centimeter tall human male in samurai armor, face is featureless. Communicates by writing Japanese characters with its sword. Non-removable. Number 5. 20 centimeter tall human infant. Nude. No genitalia. Has not displayed ability to speak, but is fluent in Japanese sign language. Number 6. 30 centimeter tall human male with flensed skin and visible organs. Head is on backwards as a result of attempts at repair. Number 7. 22 centimeter tall human adolescent female in swimsuit has disproportionately large anime style eyes non-functional number eight 24 centimeter tall human female in office clothes permanently in a seated position number nine 15 centimeter tall emperor penguin aptenodites for stary number 10 22 centimeter tall human female in gothic lolita outfit 
back of head is missing. Number 11. 21 centimeter tall human female in gymnast outfit. Feet are unfinished. Number 12. 23 centimeter tall human female in samurai armor. Number 13. 12 centimeter tall anthropomorphic insectoid with top hat, compound eyes, and four articulated hands. Produces speech sounds by rubbing its limbs together. Number 14. 10 centimeter tall anthropomorphic rodent cartoon character has disfigured itself. Number 15. 24 centimeter tall skeletal creature identified as the composite skeleton creature depicted in the closing sequence of Walt Disney's Skeleton Dance, 1929. Number 16. 30 centimeter tall demonic humanoid. Right arm held on with duct tape, left arm missing. The psychological profiles of the SCP-2372 instances are similar to a statistically improbable degree. However, rather than being a further indication of anomaly, this is believed to be a result of their common origin. Acquisition Log SCP-2371 was discovered after it uploaded several videos to the video sharing site .jp, in which it demonstrated its anomaly. A mobile task force was dispatched to its residence, where it was taken into custody, along with the instances of SCP-2372. Excerpt from Interview Log 237-411-QL Interview Subject SCP-2379 Penguin SCP-2379 I don't know, maybe it's because I'm not human. Well, humanoid. But I think I have a clearer view of our situation than the others. Dr. Gladstone Oh? SCP-23729 They're still waiting for him to come back for us. They're expecting him to rescue us, free us, repair us, all that. Dr. Gladstone And you aren't? SCP-23729 Look, I love them as much as the rest of them. But you've had us here for, what, three years? Dr. Gladstone. Four. Next month. SCP-23729. Nearly four years. And he hasn't tried anything. No raids, no infiltration, nothing. And I can't believe he'd just abandon us. At first, I thought it was just because he was your prisoner. Dr. Gladstone. I can't confirm or deny that. SCP-23729. Doctor. We know you caught him. We saw you catch him that first day before you caught us. It's just that most of the others think he escaped somehow. And Office, SCP-23728. And Skinny, SCP-23726, think that what you caught was a decoy. Dr. Gladstone, but you don't believe that. SCP-23729, oh no no no. I wish I believed he was smart enough to make a decoy. But he, well, I suppose he wasn't stupid, otherwise I wouldn't be smart, but I suppose he was… Knave? Dr. Gladstone. Naive. It's from the French. SCP-23729. Ah, thank you. Naive. That's what he was, yes. And now… Uh, now he's dead, isn't he? Dr. Gladstone. Again, I can't… SCP-23729. Can't confirm or deny, right? Honestly, though, it's the only explanation that makes sense. You let us see each other, but not him? You let us, them, have clay for repairs, but we have to do it ourselves instead of having him do it? He's dead. I… I hope he didn't suffer. Dr. Gladstone. I can't comment on that. I'm really, really sorry. You understand? SCP-23729 Yeah. Yeah. I do. Honestly, we're probably better off with you than with him. Dr. Gladstone. How so? SCP-23729 You saw his videos. You saw how quickly he could make us. Dr. Gladstone. Yes. SCP-23729 So why aren't there more of us? Dr. Gladstone. I don't… SCP-23729 There were more of us. But he unmade them. He kept getting bored with us, or unsatisfied. Dissatisfied? 
Dr. Gladstone. Ah, I believe either word will do here. SCP-23729. He kept being dissatisfied with us. And when he got dissatisfied with one of us, he'd mash them down into the goop and then start over. That's what happened to Dog and Clown and Nun and Princess. They're just gone. You realize Baby, SCP-23725, is the third Baby. The first one was a girl, but then he said he felt bad about putting so much detail into the parts of a naked baby girl. So he mashed her up and made a boy. And that didn't last either. Same reason. Finally, he decided babies don't need gender, so that's baby now. Dr. Gladstone. I had no idea. That does explain a lot. Thank you. SCP-23729. And then there's Faceless. SCP-23724. And Gothic. SCP-23710. And Gymnast. SCP-23711. If he would have just taken the extra time to finish making with their details before giving them life. Well, I can't blame him. Dr. Gladstone. Why not? SCP-23729. No. You don't understand. Earlier, I said I can't believe he'd just abandon us. I mean that literally. I can't. Just like I can't blame him. None of us can. Item number. SCP-243 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-243 is to be secured in the geometric center of a standard containment cell, no less than 16 meters by 16 meters by 16 meters. The cell is to be connected to an adjacent room of similar size and composition by one standard lockable door. All exits to the cells are to be kept locked and guarded against unauthorized access. No eligible group, more than four identical inanimate objects, is permitted into the containment cell, nor any item capable of producing such a group, except as necessary for testing. Personnel entering the cell are subject to search and seizure of unauthorized multiples. Objects animated by SCP-243 are to be removed to the adjacent room for study. Undesirable animated items are to be disposed of promptly, by incineration if appropriate. In the event that SCP-243 is applied to other SCP objects, or to other items of similar value, the flock is to be separated and held in standard safe or Euclid-class inanimate item lockers until the effects wear off. Following Incident 2432, bringing eligible groups of weapons, easily weaponized objects, or dry cell batteries into SCP-243's containment is strictly forbidden. Description SCP-243 is a mass of small dry cell batteries, all fused at their negative terminals into an ellipsoid approximately 30 centimeters long by 10 centimeters diameter. The arrangement is semi-fluid. The batteries may be rearranged by applying gentle pressure, though it is far more difficult to remove them from the central cylinder. SCP-243's unusual properties manifest when an eligible group of objects is brought into its active zone an area of indeterminate shape, extending no more than 7.3 meters or less than 2.5 meters from the center of the item. The active zone's precise extent and shape change from minute to minute. An eligible group consists of five or more identical or nearly identical inanimate objects. Nearly identical items are those that a casual observer cannot easily distinguish based on attributes other than overall color. Eligible group members animate when brought into the active zone displaying unusual flexibility and powers of levitation and locomotion. They acquire a few basic instincts, including self-preservation and variously complex flocking behavior. Objects' flocks range from simple separation alignment cohesion groups, like flocks of birds or shoals of fish, to aggregates involving role specialization and formation of discrete subunits. Animated objects also, secondarily to flocking, tend to behave in ways thematically appropriate to an object of their type. Umbrellas form large shades. Chairs make themselves available as seating. Knives seek out objects to cut, etc. An item separated from the flock wanders aimlessly or searches for other flock members. Approximately four hours after separation, the item goes dormant and loses all apparent unusual properties. At this point, 
Reuniting it with its group renders it animate again. 25 minutes after going dormant, it becomes permanently inanimate, losing all unusual properties and reverting to a normal object of its type. Whether intact or missing members, a flock deanimates permanently 24 plus or minus 2 hours after initial exposure to SCP-243. Flocks displaying complex shoaling behavior frequently fuse upon deanimation into aggregates representative of that behavior. Addendum SCP-243 came to the Foundation's attention following a series of suspicious incidents involving animation studios. The unusually fluid, natural motion depicted in the cartoons produced would not ordinarily have attracted attention, but data expunged every desk lamp in the facility. The effects wore off in the usual 24 hours. Class A amnestics were administered to the animators involved and their families, all of whom remain under surveillance. Future productions are to be monitored carefully for evidence of further interference. Addendum 2. Given the release of Animation Studios film Knickknack prior to containment of SCP-243, in which a flamingo is one of several characters, it is currently hypothesized that SCP-243 may be a possible origin for SCP-1507. The style of movement observed in SCP-1507 instances matches movement observed from the character in the film and the effects of SCP-243 would explain the former's flocking behaviors. If SCP-243 is the origin of SCP-1507, it is currently unknown why SCP-1507 has yet to deanimate, or if it will deanimate in accordance to SCP-243's behavior in the future. Item Number SCP-246 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-246 is to be kept in a wooden crate within site secure storage. Researchers who requisition its use for experimentation are responsible for their own room arrangements. SCP-246 is otherwise not to be removed from its container, especially for recreational use. Description SCP-246 is a 16mm film projector. When activated, SCP-246's projection lamp lights up, and the reels begin turning. When the projector is pointed at a screen or other white surface, a film appears, even though SCP-246's film, hereafter referred to as SCP-246-1, does not pass in front of the projection lamp. The film feeder has been welded shut, making any attempt to load SCP-246-1 into the second reel impossible. Requests to cut through or replace the feeder have been denied, due to the possibility of inadvertently breaking SCP-246. Examination of SCP-246-1 suggests that it is blank while inert, though high-speed photography shows images on the film when SCP-246 is in its active state. Analysis of these images is underway. When replaced with any other roll of 16mm film, SCP-246 continues functioning as described below. After using SCP-246 with a reel other than SCP-246-1, that reel exhibits similar properties to SCP-246-1. Microspectrometer analysis of reels made blank by SCP-246-1 has shown anomalous forms of Further analysis by Foundation researchers other than Dr. is not permitted. Despite SCP-246-1's content, or lack thereof, when activated, SCP-246 projects a short film in the style of 1950s educational films. SCP-246 seems to have a limited degree of awareness, as a female D-class subject was shown a film entitled, So You're Not Going to Live Very Long. Shortly afterwards, she was terminated at the end of the month as per procedure. An introverted D-class subject, despite previous convictions for was shown three easy ways to remove a film explaining tools and techniques for home surgery, and was subsequently terminated after his attempt to use a toothbrush as a surgical instrument. That night, Dr. employed as a surgeon before the Foundation data expunged, and who had supervised the subject, attempted to follow the film's advice. He was found dead the next day, and viscera scattered on the floor around him. 
Further experimentation resulted in the films Digestive Systems of Woodland Creatures, Three Handy Tips for Handling Amputation, and Sightless Eyes, dealing with total paralysis, which involved graphic descriptions of stroke victims' slow death by starvation before being found by relatives. All subjects suffered the described affliction shortly after exposure to SCP-246. Researchers are therefore discouraged from following SCP-246's directions and to report any urges to activate SCP-246 to their research supervisor. Item Number SCP-251 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-251 is to be kept in a locked container at all times. No one is to enter the container alone. If anyone is found to have been left alone in the container for any amount of time, they are to be treated as violently hostile and terminated with extreme prejudice. The container is to be guarded by armed personnel at all times, and guards should never allow anyone, regardless of clearance level, to move the artifact or be alone with it. Sounds of screaming, gunfire, and fires will be heard from within the container. This is normal. Description Origin Unknown SCP-251 consistently appears to be a small snow globe. Attached is a series of photographs taken of the same artifact over time. This indicates that the snow globe is at least partially animate. However, when viewed directly by multiple people, there is no apparent movement, except by a perpetual blizzard. SCP-251 has not been moved since its arrival at Site-19, but the snowflakes have never ceased falling. The scenes depicted in SCP-251 are all extremely violent or morbid, occasionally depicting something fantastical, while mostly depicting more realistic brutality. All those who have been alone with SCP-251 for any amount of time have later displayed extreme violence, xenophobia, and emotional distress. Item Number SCP-254 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-254 is to be kept in a standard storage locker when not in use. When in storage, it must be placed face down on the floor of the locker and secured with straps to prevent accidental activation. Use of SCP-254 may be requested by any department head and must be approved by at least two Level 3 personnel. SCP-254 may not be used in a capacity that will result in SCP-2541's contact with SCPs posing a mimetic contagion hazard. Under no circumstances is SCP-254 to be active in a single department or area for longer than 26 days. Reuse is permitted only if the area in question has undergone a complete personnel rotation i.e., no employees remain who have had previous contact with SCP-254. Description SCP-254 is a rectangular wooden plaque, measuring 22 cm by 30 cm, and weighing approximately 1.5 kg. On the front of the plaque is an empty brass picture holder, as well as a printed metal plate with a black background and gold-colored letters reading, Employee of the Month. Affixed to the back of the plaque is a standard hanging device. SCP-254 was discovered in the rubble of a Texaco gas station in Kansas in 1950. A Foundation agent secured SCP-254 after discovering that it had sustained no damage in the explosion that had leveled the gas station and resulted in the deaths of numerous employees and civilians. When SCP-254 is hung on a wall in a work area of four or more people, SCP-2541 will appear soon afterward. SCP-2541 will arrive either at the end of the next designated break period or at the beginning of the following work shift. SCP-2541 is an incorporeal human of variable gender, age, race, name, and appearance, able to manipulate objects in the manner similar to that of a normal human, of average strength and coordination. SCP-2541 will adopt the appearance and persona of a model employee, based on an area's mimetic consensus. Once SCP-2541's appearance has been established, 
an image of SCP-2541 that appears to be an 8x10 glossy photograph fills the empty picture holder, and it will not change until SCP-254 is moved to a new location. Across the bottom of the photograph, in print, is the newly assumed name of SCP-2541. The photograph cannot be removed from the picture holder by any known means, but it can be torn or ripped. Doing so in an aggressive or purposeful manner results in a violent reaction from SCP-2541. Regardless of appearance, SCP-2541 maintains a cheerful demeanor at all times. SCP-2541 is able to carry on conversations about the weather, traffic, the previous night's TV shows, sports, and other such topics. Although SCP-2541 will never discuss topics of which present individuals have no knowledge, personnel assigned to work in an area where SCP-254 is in use do not appear alarmed by SCP-2541's incorporeal nature or sudden appearance, stating that SCP-2541, quote, works here. Due to local personnel's reluctance to remove the plaque, or inability to remember to remove the plaque, removal is to be scheduled and performed by off-site personnel. SCP-2541 is capable of performing menial tasks quickly and efficiently. When given tasks that require specialized training, although SCP-2541 does not possess the required expertise, she will attempt them with the usual good attitude, but will perform as well as an average person could be expected to perform. SCP-2541 will continue to perform as exemplary an employee as possible for a length of time between 28 to 46 workdays usually ending at the conclusion of a calendar month. If SCP-254 is placed in a workplace several days into a calendar month, SCP-2541 will act as an effective employee until the end of the following month. Although, due to the dangers posed by shifting mimetic consensus, no use of SCP-254 for longer than 26 days is permitted. After the month has passed, if SCP-254 is not removed, SCP-2541 will begin to degrade in performance, beginning with an unhelpful attitude and forgetfulness. If SCP-254 is not removed, SCP-2541 will become a worse and worse employee until, quote, fired. Firing can be represented by removing SCP-254 from the wall or by informing SCP-2541 of its termination. If SCP-2541 is fired within approximately 20 days from the start of its decline in performance, SCP-2541 simply leaves the area and disappears. Following cessation of employment after this point, SCP-2541 will actively sabotage the work area in the most destructive manner possible, posing severe hazard to any nearby personnel. And the world, people! We work with SCPs here, and if proper removal arrangements are not made with off-site security and documented with on-site security, the offending employee will find themselves jobless, or worse. 05 Addendum Following Incident 254-0210G, all tests on employing SCP-2541 beyond 26 days must be conducted at a separate site containing no other SCPs. No exceptions. 05 Audio Log 254-A13 Doctor This is Doctor This is experiment number 13 on SCP-254. I am using a standard Phillips head screwdriver to attempt to remove the brass fitting from SCP-254. There are 15 seconds of tool working sounds. It appears that these screws are affixed by means beyond the normal. Perhaps glue or something else. SCP-2541, going by Gus this iteration. Would you like me to get you some solvent, sir? Doctor. No thanks, Gus. No need. Would you hand me that box cutter? I'll try cutting this picture out. Gus. Really? Why would you want to do that? I think that plaque looks Jim Dandy right where it is. Doctor. Now, now. This isn't an insult to you, Gus. You're a great employee. This is an experiment. Gus. Okay, Doc. I trust you. There is a slight paper ripping noise. Gus. What you doing, Doc? Would you please not do that? Doctor. 
just a little bit fur. The audio of the two cuts out, and there are five hard banging sounds. Presumably, SCP-2541 slamming Dr. P's head against the table. Then there is a wet sound, as the box cutter is data expunged. End of tape. Experiment Log 254-B Testing on extended employment of SCP-2541 as a janitor at Sector Day 26 End of standard employment period reached. SCP-2541's performance continues to meet high standards. Day 32 First sign of performance degradation noted. SCP-2541 leaves a dirty rag on one of the research assistants' desk. Apologetic when rag is noticed and returned. Day 34. SCP-2541 is mopping the floor in Sector when a hurrying technician trips over the bucket of cleaning solution. SCP-2541 recorded cursing at the technician. Day 35. End of the calendar month. SCP-2541 described as sullen by a late working researcher. Break room kitchen in Sector left uncleaned. Coffee spilled around Dr. P's garbage can. Day 36. SCP-2541 reprimanded by supervisor for apparent drunkness. Note. Very odd. SCP-2541 has never been seen to eat or drink. Day 39. SCP-2541 fails to return cleaning solutions to the janitorial closet. Near disaster when mentally disturbed test subject finds a bottle of ammonia-based cleaner in a bathroom. SCP-2541 reprimanded for carelessness. A fellow janitor observed in a verbal altercation with SCP-2541. Both parties are somewhat vague on the cause of the quarrel. Day 43. SCP-2541 again observed to be apparently drunk on duty. Cleaning is becoming noticeably more erratic. Day 48. Fire alarm goes off in Sector False alarm. Ink markers fail to pinpoint a culprit, but SCP-2541 was observed near the tripped alarm a few minutes prior to the incident. Security footage unavailable due to an unidentifiable object blocking the camera's view of the hallway. Day 56. Dr. upbraids SCP-2541 for removing perishable items from the lab refrigerator and shredding irreplaceable experiment logs. SCP-2541 calls said doctor data expunged and threatens to data expunged. Security called. Day 58. Kitchen knife found stabbed deeply into Dr. P's whiteboard. Said doctor's locked secure document safe has been opened and rifled. Guard posted at the door to said doctor's office. SCP-2541 recorded arguing with undisclosed and raised voices in the staff break room. Day 59. Janitor S. signs into work, but fails to report to supervisor. Located by accident several hours later, trapped in the cold storage rooms, attached to an autopsy theater, suffering from severe hypothermia. Guard on duty at Dr. P's office incapacitated by a blow to the head. Crude human figure formed from a mop head impaled on a broken mop handle, driven through Dr. P's desk chair. SCP-2541, nowhere to be found. Day 60. At Dr. P's request, SCP-254 removed from the wall. SCP-2541 leaves the building and vanishes. Day 61. SCP-2541 caught on camera in Sector late at night. Power failure and multiple backup system failures caused several containment breaches, resulting in numerous direct casualties and a few further losses from sterilization of an outbreak of SCP- Item Number SCP-271 Object Class Catter Special Containment Procedures SCP-271 is to be stored as long as possible in Containment Unit Exclamation Point 12 on a meter-high stone pedestal, SCP-2711, which will be flooded with water and sealed off in a hollow 5-centimeter-thick sphere composed of glass saturated with iron. Permanent neodymium 
Magnets will be mounted around the standard-sized room to suspend the sphere in air and repel unwanted intruders. The room will be lined with pyrolytic carbon to contain the magnetic field generated by the magnets. The door to the room is to be left unguarded and disguised as an ordinary janitorial closet and kept locked by an unobtrusive password box mounted in the wall down the hallway and around the corner that appears to be a thermostat. Dr. Vig is to change the password on a monthly basis. All study is to be observation only until further notice. In case of unauthorized access, electromagnets in the room are to be activated by remote to destroy the glass sphere so that recovery may be simplified. Description SCP-271 is a small disk, composition unknown but metallic in nature, a little more than 4 centimeters in diameter, and engraved with a number of symbols that may or may not represent an unknown alphabet. These symbols are infectious to their environment over time, gradually appearing as if invisibly carved into nearby objects. They are capable of escaping through any hole, however minute, but have been demonstrated to be unable to penetrate non-gaseous fluids. Objects that carry the symbols for a sufficient time begin to change on a molecular level to the same material as the SCP. Both the engraving and petrification processes are extremely painful to biotic organisms. The only known method for purging the symbols is the destruction of the object, and it is not possible to do this to SCP-271 itself. At this time, both SCP-271 and SCP-2711 are thoroughly coated with the engraved symbols and seem to swim slightly. Dr. V and other observers have described them as looking like the far side of a heat wave, or not quite all there. The symbols also appear to have fractalized somewhat. Studies with vision-enhancing equipment have revealed miniature symbols inside and around the larger carvings on both objects. SCP-271 was a previously unknown SCP, recently acquired from a shrine belonging to the Church of the Broken God by Mobile Arm Task Force 12 when data expunged. It was previously stored in a room of its own, which documents note was to be kept sealed until the assembly was ready. The platform is original. On account of the extensive writing on the room in which it was contained, the shrine itself was pulverized. However, due to rapid retaliation by enemy forces, the remnants of MATF-12 were forced to data expunged. Contact has been re-established. But the nature of the SCP and the enemy seekers prevent easy recovery, and it is currently considered more advisable for the SCP to remain hidden, if comparatively unprotected, than to attract attention by launching a very expensive recovery mission. MATF-12 has been ordered to conform itself into CU exclamation mark 12, the exclamation mark denoting their atypical existence outside of a secured SCP Foundation area. Addendum. SCP-271 is not to be brought into the presence of SCP-882. Emergency Bulletin Reports from other embedded sources indicate that as of the Church is aware of CU-12 and the location of SCP-271 and is planning an imminent assault against the unit. SCP-271 is to be kept out of enemy hands at all costs. CU exclamation mark 12 has been ordered to mobilize and prepare for evacuation. A recovery team is being prepared for immediate deployment under the direction of Agent DuPont. A more detailed report is to follow. Item number SCP-286 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-286 is to be kept in a secure containment cell at Site-19 that allows an open, secure perimeter of at least 50 meter radius around SCP-286. Only D-Class personnel are permitted to have direct physical contact with SCP-286, and only as part of an approved experiment. Update 0719-2000 Experiments with SCP-286 are hereby suspended until further notice. 05 Surveillance cameras are to be positioned to allow 360-degree monitoring of SCP-286 during experimentation. Recordings shall be maintained and cataloged of all Sigma states exhibited by SCP-286. Update 0311 2000 
As of Incident I-2865, surveillance of SCP-286 is to be continuous, and any initiation of a Sigma state is to be immediately reported to Overwatch Command. Outside the immediate Project Directorate, the SCP-286 Sigma State Archives and Associated Material are to be restricted to Level 4 access. Under no circumstances are identified instances of SCP-2861 or SCP-2862 to be prevented from having contact with SCP-286. 05 Description SCP-286 is a carved stone game board, measuring 83 centimeters on a side. It bears markings consistent with the Chinese game of Lu Bo. Based on artifacts found with SCP-286 during recovery, SCP-286 has been dated to at least the Shang Dynasty, though all attempts to date the carvings directly have been inconclusive. Analysis of SCP-286's composition has shown high concentrations of iron and nickel, and crystalline microstructures consistent with If any higher order mammal touches SCP-286, it will initiate a Sigma state. A Sigma state is indicated by the appearance of 12 tokens on the surface of the game board. The tokens appear to be constructed of the same material as SCP-286. Six tokens are dark, absorbing 75% more ambient light than the board's surface, while six tokens are light, emitting 75% more ambient light than that which actually strikes them. Appearing with the tokens on the game surface are two 18-sided dice, apparently made of bronze. As with the game tokens, a direct physical examination of the dice has proved to be impossible. The dice share the anomalous reflective and absorption properties shown by the game tokens. One light, and one dark. Otherwise, the dice appear consistent with dice found in non-anomalous Lubo sets recovered from various Chinese archaeological sites. A Sigma state will also manifest SCP-2861 and SCP-2862 to play a game. SCP-2861 and SCP-2862 are higher order mammals who have suffered temporary alterations in patterns of movement, cognition, behavior and vocalization. SCP-2861 will appear agitated, movements will become jerky and imprecise, vocalizations will be quick, stuttering, and aggressive. SCP-2862 will appear sluggish, movements halting and slow. Vocalizations will be low-pitched, throaty, and tend to be monosyllabic. Subjects capable of human speech will converse, but only to their opposite number during a Sigma event. Such conversations, or monologues in the case of a subject facing a non-human opponent, are conducted in a random sequence of human languages, sometimes shifting multiple times within a single statement. Only 45% of the recorded conversations between SCP-2861 and SCP-2862 have been successfully translated to date. The subject who initiated the Sigma state will become an instance of SCP-2861 if they touched SCP-286 on an illuminated surface, or they will become an instance of SCP-2862 if they touched SCP-286 on a surface that is in shadow. In either case, the subject will take a seated position to one side of the board, Instances of SCP-2861 will take a position on the side nearest the light game tokens. Instances of SCP-2862 will take a position on the opposing side, nearest the dark game tokens, and roll one of the two dice manifested by SCP-286. After the die is rolled, some other higher order mammal will appear within 47 meters of SCP-286 and become the subject's opposition. SCP-2862 in the case where the subject is SCP-2861, or SCP-2861 in the case where the subject is SCP-2862. This selection appears related to the result of the first die roll. After appearing, the subject's opposition will take a seated position facing the subject, and will commence playing the first move. Gameplay then consists of SCP-2861 and SCP-2862 alternately rolling dice, and moving pieces on the board in complex patterns. A game is won when the center square contains all of one side's tokens, and only that side's tokens. A winning move concludes a Sigma state. During a Sigma state, 
SCP-2861 and SCP-2862 will show no reaction to any external stimuli that does not physically interfere with SCP-2861, SCP-2862, and their interaction with the game. If something disrupts an ongoing game, then either SCP-2861 or SCP-2862 will stand and vocalize a statement that most commonly translates as forfeit, less commonly as draw. This event will also conclude a Sigma state. When a Sigma state concludes, players cease being designated SCP-2861 or SCP-2862, and game tokens, dice, and the subject's opposing player all vanish. All observed subjects, and those opposing players who have been identified and examined, have shown no physical after-effects from interaction with SCP-286. However, all cases have shown a marked increase in spirituality and interest in religious subjects, including, but not limited to, adoption of new belief systems, taking on of vows, speaking in tongues, and prophetic visions. For the winning player, this new spirituality will tend to take an optimistic, messianic character. For the losing player, attitudes will tend toward the apocalyptic. Addendum 1 Technical Note TN-286-55 SCP-286's Possible Relationship to Divination and or Revelation Historically, Lubo was not only a game, but also used as a method of divination. The various spots on the game board corresponding to the sexagenary cycle used by Chinese to recount the passage of time since the earliest written texts. Given the propensity of subjects to have prophetic visions subsequent to their participation in a Sigma event, it has been theorized by several researchers that the moves during a Sigma event may themselves be of some prophetic significance. While the possible significance of individual moves during recorded Sigma events is ongoing and so far inconclusive, it has been determined that the act of winning does appear to correspond to significant events beyond the game itself. In particular, Every instance of SCP-2861 winning has been tied to intensification of sunspots, solar flares, and generally increased solar activity. SCP-2862 winning has been associated with significant tectonic events, including because it is not known if these events were predicted by one side winning or caused by one side winning. Experimentation on SCP-286 has been suspended as an unacceptable risk. Addendum 2 Document TR-28627E Excerpted translation of dialogue between SCP-2861 and SCP-2862 during Sigma Event Number 27. Forward D-Class test subject was a male Caucasian, 44 years of age, identified as SCP-2861 after initiation of a Sigma state. Opposition player SCP-2862 was an as-yet unidentified Hispanic female, approximately 20 years of age. The Sigma state lasted for 68 minutes, at which time SCP-2861 achieved the winning move. During the Sigma event, the players conversed in 25 known languages and approximately 15 unknown languages. 30% of their dialogue was undecipherable or in an indeterminate language marking this episode the most completely translated yet recorded. Begin transcript, 1300 hours, date undisclosed. SCP-2861, you move rotate slowly imprecisely as untranslatable matter, earth, universe. SCP-2862, have, possess, patience, my, our, brother, and still quiet silence, untranslatable, Mind, thoughts, brain. SCP-2861, untranslatable. SCP-2862, laughs. Distress, discomfort, displeasure, untranslatable to you. SCP-2861, why would I untranslatable? Your sins, perversions, abominations. SCP-2862 laughs. SCP-2861 You disgust me. Untranslatable. Matter, Earth, Universe. Disgusts me. SCP-2862 You untranslatable in that meat skin. This amuses me. 
SCP-2861, untranslatable. SCP-2862, move, process, sequence. SCP-2861, every time, moment, eternity. My untranslatable, closer. I must, will, shall, illuminate, enlighten. This untranslatable. SCP-2862, size, move, process, sequence. SCP-2861, you are too comfortable, undisturbed, enslaved, bound, chained, within untranslatable, meat doll puppet. Do you untranslatable, love, arousal, untranslatable? SCP-2862, move, process, sequence, or forfeit. SCP-2861, untranslatable. SCP-2862, untranslatable. Exiled, banished, me to matter, earth, universe, untranslatable, no, understand, me more than you. SCP-2861, untranslatable, will no, understand me, and be consumed, engulfed, destroyed by knowledge, understanding. SCP-2862, but brother, I am so much closer. End transcript, 1312, date undisclosed. Addendum 3, Incident Report, I-2865. SCPs involved, SCP-286, SCP-2861, SCP-2862, SCP-4351. Date, 3-11-2000. Location. SCP-286's containment area, Site-19. Description. At 531 UTC, standard security monitoring SCP-286's containment area detected the unauthorized presence of Dr. S.S., a Foundation researcher temporarily assigned to Site-19, most recently assigned to the study of SCP-435. All experimentation on SCP-286 had been suspended for the preceding eight months and no activity with the object had been approved. A security team was dispatched, reaching Dr. S as she entered SCP-286's containment area. Upon arrival, the security team discovered the presence of Dr. L.W., a researcher assigned to SCP-286, already seated behind the dark side of SCP-286. SCP-286 showed the signs of already being in a Sigma state. Both researchers showed behavioral anomalies, consistent with SCP-2861 and SCP-2862. Believing an unauthorized experiment was underway, the security team restrained Dr. S before she could seat herself at SCP-286. In response, Dr. L stood and vocalized what has been identified as vulgate Latin words for grand forfeit. The Sigma state concluded at 545 UTC. Neither researcher could provide any explanation of how they were affected by SCP-286. Dr. S's last recollection was having a cup of coffee at a staff commissary on the other side of the Site-19 complex from SCP-286, while Dr. L reported that he had been reading emails in his office when he blacked out. Simultaneously, with the cessation of SCP-286's Sigma state, there was a sudden emergency in when SCP-4351 unexpectedly entered an active state, moving erratically and data expunged, impacting the ocean basin, causing a data expunged. Contingency 435XK-Alpha had been initiated, but she was cancelled when SCP-4351 came to rest three minutes later. Note: SCP-286 classification is hereby upgraded to Euclid. 05 Item number, SCP-292, Object Class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures, SCP-292 is to be kept at Site-72, in a guarded room in a locked padded container set up to avoid movement of or damage to SCP-292. Access to SCP-292 is prohibited without Level 3 authorization. Site personnel must report all incidents of deja vu or related symptoms to site administration. Description 
SCP-292 is a 60-second brass hourglass, 10 centimeters tall. When all its sand is at the bottom and SCP-292 is flipped over, only two outcomes have ever been observed. Either the sand runs out normally after one minute, or SCP-292 is knocked over on its side. If SCP-292 is knocked over, anomalous properties do not again manifest until all the sand in SCP-292 is in one bulb. At no time has SCP-292 ever been observed to be flipped over a second time within 60 seconds, except when knocked over as above. Any time SCP-292 is upright and all its sand is in its bottom bulb, and a subject attempts to flip SCP-292 over, with the intent to flip it again before all its sand runs out, the subject and people nearby suddenly experience deja vu. The intensity of deja vu is inversely proportional to a person's distance from SCP-292. The subject is often momentarily stunned by the experience. Persons experiencing deja vu from the same event often describe similar recalled experiences. It is believed that when SCP-292 is flipped over, a process is started in which, if SCP-292 is flipped again before its sands run out, time flows in reverse to a point a couple of seconds before SCP-292 was initially flipped. Time then flows forward again as if SCP-292 were never flipped. Deja vu would thus be a side effect of this process. Prolonged exposure to SCP-292 can cause nausea, migraines, vertigo, hallucinations, seizures, and symptoms consistent with temporal disjunction, somatic psychological, or both. Addendum 1. Experiment 292-31 Procedure Subject 03101 was instructed to flip SCP-292 over and then shoot Subject 03102 to death and flip SCP-292 back over before it runs out. Results As Subject 1 reached for SCP-292, both subjects, as well as other personnel in the area, reported feeling deja vu. Subject 1 exhibited elevated levels of adrenaline, while Subject 2 exhibited pronounced apprehension in the presence of Subject 1. Addendum 2 Experiment 292-46 Procedure Subject 04601 was instructed to flip SCP-292 over, wait 30 seconds, and flip SCP-292 back over. When deja vu was experienced, Subject 04602 was instructed to do the same thing. When deja vu was experienced a second time, Subject 04603 was instructed to do the same thing. Results As Subject 1 reached for SCP-292, all subjects experienced deja vu as expected. Subject 2 hesitated and was instructed to flip SCP-292. While reaching for SCP-292, Subject 2 fell to his knees, Subject 1 doubled over, and Subject 3 staggered. Subject 3 was instructed to flip SCP-292, and as he reached for SCP-292, all subjects appeared to exhibit temporal shock for 10 to 15 seconds before falling unconscious. Temporal symptoms subsided within five to seven days, while visual and audio hallucinations persisted for several months more. Addendum 3 Incident 292-04 While preparing for Experiment 292-75, Dr. suddenly clutched SCP-292 to his chest and reported he had just experienced deja vu. Dr. said that he felt like he was about to drop SCP-292, and if he did, something bad would happen. Dr. has hypothesized that Dr. had indeed dropped SCP-292, but instead of breaking, SCP-292 reversed the flow of time until a moment before it was dropped. If SCP-292 does in fact possess such a self-preservation system, the potential consequences, data expunged, Reclassification to Euclid approved until more information on SCP-292's properties can be gathered and analyzed. Item Number SCP-316 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-316 needs no special containment, 
other than to prevent misuse by unauthorized personnel. Those operating SCP-316 should wear highly reflective full-body wear to prevent accidental exposure. Personnel privy to sensitive information should be kept out of visual range of SCP-316 due to its ability to induce a suggestive state. Description SCP-316 is a bronze-aged carbide lamp. The casing corresponds to no manufactured models and appears to be homemade. The bulb is ordinary and can be replaced without impeding the function of SCP-316. Internal circuitry of SCP-316 is constructed of an unknown metal rather than copper. The casing has a battery compartment, which takes two D batteries. SCP-316 does not function unless two D batteries are in the battery compartment with their positive ends facing each other. When switched on, SCP-316's bulb emits a nearly opaque beam of white light. Non-reflective objects and materials in contact with this light have their molecular structure rearranged into patterns which homogenize reflected photons, distributing their wavelengths equally throughout the visual spectrum. Effectively, over approximately six cumulative seconds of exposure, affected surfaces lose all color, retaining shades of gray of the same luminosity as the original surface. Reflective surfaces remain unaffected, but appear to stop SCP-316's light rather than reflecting it. SCP-316 has a temporary but more drastic effect on living or sentient organisms. Its effect is spread evenly across an organism, even internally, as long as part of the organism is exposed to its light. Effects set in over approximately 27 cumulative seconds of exposure and gradually wear off over the next 24 hours. In addition to loss of color, most affected organisms experience the following. Color blindness, lower body temperature, low energy, slowed movements, monotonic slurred speech, inattentiveness, short-term memory loss, apathy, lack of aggression, negligible emotional response, passive cooperation with instructions, relative lack of desire to lie or deceive, limited capacity for foresight or creative thought. After recovering from the effects of SCP-316, most subjects report symptoms of nausea and depression for up to one week. Almost all subjects, once recovered, volunteer their displeasure at having been exposed to SCP-316 and may violently resist further exposure. Cross-experimentation between SCP-316 and uncooperative living SCPs for the purposes of pacification has been approved. Addendum 316A SCP-316 was recovered from the residence of a colorblind man arrested for counterfeiting in Texas. The man had reportedly attempted to pay for items at a convenience store with colorless bills. A Secret Service investigator noted the apparent quality and validity of the bills, as well as the ink's chemical equivalency with federal ink, and the foundation investigated. The subject's house was mostly colorless, as it seemed he had been using SCP-316 to navigate at night. Neighbors reported the subject to have been withdrawn and depressingly dull. Subject was terminated and his property destroyed. Addendum 316B Experiment Log of Dr. Blast Testing SCP-316 on Sentient SCPs Date Undisclosed Exposure to Aggressive Humanoid SCPs Experiment 1 Exposure to SCP-213 Full effects of SCP-316 confirmed after 25 seconds of exposure. SCP-213 exhibits normal symptoms of exposure. Subject is still able to disintegrate matter when ordered to do so, but to a diminished extent, approximately 9% normal speed. Testing concluded. After recovery, subject shows a willingness to comply with Foundation commands to avoid future exposure to SCP-316. Note, my heart nearly jumped out when he started melting matter, but scares aside, 
This test has proven very useful. We can use SCP-316 to ensure cooperation when these SCPs disagree with us, and then hold it over their heads like a whip when they think of doing it again. Dr. Blast Experiment 2 Exposure to SCP-076-2 Able Full effects of SCP-316 confirmed after 30 seconds of exposure. SCP-076-2 enters a catatonic stupor, still upright. At 49 seconds, subject proceeds to dispassionately kill all nearby personnel. Kill switch activated remotely by Dr. Blast. Assistants to Dr. Blast note him hammering kill switch frantically for up to 16 seconds after SCP-076-2 was pacified. Testing suspended. After revival, when questioned, SCP-076-2 remarked that SCP-316 had made him feel extremely bored. What else was I supposed to do? Note, Jesus, I guess monsters don't react the same way to this thing. It's a good thing I opted to stay in Site-17 during the procedure. Dr. Blast Note, Dr. Blast will be supervising all further SCP-316 testing remotely as with the previous procedure. Data expunged. Experiment 5. Exposure to SCP-56. Full effects of SCP-316 confirmed after 30 seconds of exposure. SCP-56 changes into a gray replica of one of the researchers in the testing room, shifting between several of them as tests are conducted. Personality and effects of subject remain unchanged. Only the physical form appears to be affected. As researchers read out results for Dr. Blast, viewing remotely via camera, SCP-56 takes the form of Dr. Blast. Microphone in Dr. Blast's area records him shouting an expletive and falling over with his chair. Testing concluded. Note: Nobody told me this thing could breach camera transmissions. I've probably been mentally breached as well. I can feel it already, damn it. My head's probably going to explode! This thing can destroy brains, right? Who the hell designed 56's containment procedures anyway? Damn it! I can't move! I can't f***ing move! Wheel me down to the infirmary! Hurry! Dr. Blast Note Medical personnel found no physical or mental problems with Dr. Blast. Research assistant has requested a transfer. Data expunged. Experiment 8 Exposure to SCP-343 Data expunged and riots in Italy, which data expunged. Effects of in Site-17 Dr. Blast informed of results after regaining consciousness. Further testing attempts suspended. Note, as we informed you the sixth time, Dr. Blast, under no conditions are we approving your emergency transfer requests. O5 Note What the fuck is he doing with a safe classification? Tell O5 I'm not supervising tests on anything outside of my security clearance again, damn it. Dr. Blast Experiment 9 Exposure to SCP-6621 Mr. Deeds Full effects of SCP-316 confirmed after 28 seconds of exposure to which the subject exhibits normal symptoms. Subject is asked to explain his origin and other previously unobtainable information. Subject remains silent and unresponsive. Administering researcher asks subject to obtain a glass of lemonade, to which he responds that he is tired and would rather not. Researcher insists. Subject leaves in the expected manner and returns with a glass on a tray, which is empty, save for three cubes of ice and a wedge of lemon. Upon questioning, subject responds that he was thirsty. When dismissed and summoned again with SCP-662, subject returns free of symptoms and immediately apologizes to researcher for his unprofessional conduct. When asked about the effects of exposure to SCP-316, subject replied that they were unpleasant. Testing concluded. Note: Cheeky bastard. Dr. Blast Awaiting Declassification Item Number SCP-318 Object Class 
safe. Special Containment Procedures SCP-318 is to be kept in the center of a chamber at least 5 meters by 8 meters by 5 meters, resting on a hydraulic lift to allow examination of the underside of the device. The door to this chamber is to be kept locked at all times, with access codes available to any level 3 or higher staff, with access by personnel of level 2 clearance or below, requiring approval from at least one level 4 staff member. Instances of SCP-3181 are to be kept completely wound, except during testing, and stored in secure item storage. Unrolling or communicating with SCP-3181 is prohibited outside testing, and all personnel interacting with SCP-3181 are to be subjected to regular psychiatric evaluations, until at least one month after the most recent interaction. Description SCP-318 appears similar to a small version of a crude rotary printing press, with a great deal of additional machinery attached at various locations. The device is composed primarily of a variety of hardwoods, with metallic parts made from brass, bronze, cast or wrought iron, copper, steel, and aluminum. SCP-318 in its entirety is approximately 3.5 meters wide. 6 meters long, and 2 meters tall. A more complete physical description can be found in Addendum 3182. When a living human, or a human cadaver that has been dead less than 6 hours, is placed in the input box and the lid closed, SCP-318 activates, using an undetermined power source. Cameras placed inside with test subjects have not been recovered but video transmitted prior to their destruction shows data expunged, with the vocalizations of conscious subjects audible to observers outside the box. During the process, lids of both boxes lock in place, such that any force sufficient to open them would likely also cause significant damage to SCP-318. Tests using this level of force are currently awaiting approval. SCP-318 remains active for approximately 5 minutes per use, with exact time seemingly dependent upon the body mass and physical condition of the subject. After SCP-318 ceases activity, all covers unlock, the test subject is no longer present in the input box, and a scroll, designated SCP-3181, is present in the output box. SCP-3181 takes the form of a strip of paper 7 inches or 17.8 centimeters wide and 2 feet 60.1 centimeters long, wrapped around a black enameled wooden dowel 1 inch or 2.5 centimeters in diameter and 8 inches 20.3 centimeters long. The dowel and paper appear entirely normal, though testing reveals the presence of human DNA, matching that of converted subject present in the paper. This scroll contains the memories and consciousness of the test subject, who is able to communicate when SCP-3181 is at least partially unrolled, by causing drawings and or writing to appear on the paper. These marks only appear on the side of the paper that faces inward when rolled up, and are generally consistent with the penmanship and artistic ability of the subject, though the quality of drawings improves markedly when SCP-3181 can see what it is depicting. Subjects stored on instances of SCP-3181 report the ability to feel the scroll as if it were their body, expressing a corresponding form of pain when the paper is cut, torn, burned, data expunged, or otherwise distressed. Significant damage appears to render SCP-3181 inoperative in some way, as once the scroll is damaged beyond a certain extent, Generally, the compromise of at least 1% of the paper's surface. Subjects are unresponsive and display no further activity. It is currently unknown whether this is because the copy of the subject has been destroyed or because their mode of communication has been cut off. In addition, so long as SCP-3181 is at least partially unrolled, subjects are apparently able to perceive their environment, visually and orally, with an acuity consistent with an average human adult. Requests for testing on blind and or deaf subjects are currently pending approval. Personas stored on instances of SCP-3181 respond as would be expected from the original subject, and have full access to the subject's memory, as well as a complete memory of their time stored on SCP-3181. 
They are unable to exert any direct influence on objects or personnel, and though they can make requests of a reader, the reader is under no obligation or compulsion to accede to these requests. Testing has shown no mimetic properties in writings or drawings on SCP-3181, and subjects do not appear to be more persuasive than they were while alive. However, some staff have, through prolonged interaction, displayed sympathy towards SCP-3181 subjects. Such individuals should be transferred to non-sentient SCP items, or terminated if a transfer is not feasible. Addendum 3181 SCP-318 was recovered by Foundation agents on date undisclosed, In stories of a Library of the Ancestors caught the attention of Dr. who was vacationing nearby. Investigation revealed an isolated monastery containing both SCP-318 and several hundred instances of SCP-3181. Both the press and the scrolls were taken into Foundation custody along with a number of other suspicious items, none of which have yet proven anomalous. The monks questioned and terminated, and the monastery destroyed. Local news reports the following day reflected the accidental fire which claimed the lives of all its inhabitants, as well as their extensive collection of antiques. Efforts are ongoing to determine whether any instances of SCP-3181 remain in existence outside Foundation custody. Addendum 3182 Some parts of SCP-318 appear to be significantly older than others, with the aluminum parts clearly manufactured in modern times, while carbon dating has placed some of the wooden components to before the 10th century CE. It is currently unknown whether the more recent parts were installed to replace broken parts, or whether they are part of some sort of modification on the original design. The presumably oldest, and possibly original parts, are distributed throughout the device, suggesting that its overall age is at least 1100 years, despite the fact that this predates the first known appearance of several elements of its design by centuries. The modifications present in SCP-318 compared to a normal rotary press are extensive, and a full listing of these can be found in Those with the greatest known relevance are as follows. In place of the hopper that would normally feed paper into a press of this design, there is a large section of machinery, comprising almost half of the total size of SCP-318, including a hinged lidded box constructed of oak, bearing a bronze plaque displaying the word Materia, and has interior dimensions of approximately 1.83 meters, 6 feet, long, and 0.91 meters, or 3 feet square. A second box, one-eighth the dimensions of the first, to six significant figures, is located where the output would normally be on a press of similar design, and bears a plaque reading Sententia. Discoloration of the wood around each plaque indicates that they may not be original. The components which would normally transfer ink and water to their respective rollers are absent, with several cloth and leather hoses running to the materia box. Testing of the roller surfaces for residues has thus far been inconclusive. Addendum 3183 Work is currently underway to catalog the recovered SCP-3181 for selected interview excerpts and stimulus test results. See the following experiment log 318. Note. Interviews were conducted by unrolling samples of SCP-3181 and placing the open scroll on a table in view of a video camera. See Video Archive 3182 for original interview footage. All interviews in this document have been translated into modern English for ease of reading. Only excerpts of the selected interviews are presented here. For complete transcripts, see Document 318- Interviewer Dr. J Date Undisclosed Interview Subject SCP-31827 Original Language Latin Notes Subject's responses are in good quality penmanship, in a style typical of 13th century European writings. Begin Interview Log SCP-31827 I see I have been moved. Where is this place? Who are you? 
Dr. J. You can call me Dr. J. Please state your name for the record. SCP-318-127. Pleased to meet you. Dr. J. And when were you born? SCP-318-127. I was born in the year of our Lord 12 and was consigned to this form 28 years later. Dr. J. You say you were consigned to this form. Were you still alive when you were converted by SCP-318? SCP-318-127. Of course. Were I otherwise, my soul would not have been present to be stored thus. Dr. J. Can you describe the conversion process, from your perspective? SCP-318-127. I have some memory of those events, but it is both jumbled and exceptionally unpleasant. I would prefer to speak on a different subject. Dr. J. Please describe your recollections of the conversion process. SCP-318-127. May we speak about something else, please? How much time has passed since I was last opened? Dr. J. If you do not answer the question, we will take whatever means are necessary to ensure your further compliance. SCP-318-127. Very well. As the lid of the materia box closed, data expunged. Dr. J. That was interesting. Thank you. SCP-318-127. What events have transpired of late in the world? My previous caretakers would keep me abreast of recent happenings. Dr. J. I am afraid that is all the time we have allotted for this interview. Perhaps next time. End log. Interviewer. Dr. H. Date. Undisclosed. Interview subject. SCP-318-112. Original language. Archaic Japanese. Dialect and calligraphy consistent with 16th century. Begin interview log. SCP-318-112. Thank you. It is good to see and hear again. Dr. H. Please explain. Why couldn't you see or hear? SCP-318-112. You don't know? No. You're not one of our regular caretakers. And this isn't our home. Where am I? Who are you? And how did I get here? Dr. H. You can call me Dr. H. And this is a research facility. Unfortunately, the monastery at which you previously resided was destroyed by a fire, with no survivors, save on scrolls, like yourself, which we recovered for preservation and study. Now, why couldn't you see or hear? SCP-318-112 When we are rolled up, we are cut off from the world outside. For short periods, it can be quite peaceful and relaxing but it gets quite lonely if it goes on too long. I have gone a long time without being opened, and it was quite a relief to finally reconnect to the world. Dr. H. I believe I understand. So, does the extent to which you are enrolled impact your ability to see and hear? SCP-318-112. Not in my experience. Dr. H. Thank you, Twelve. You have been most helpful. I look forward to our next interview. SCP-318-112. Please, don't close me yet. You just opened me. I want to see. Please don't clo- Further text is not visible from this point, as Dr. H finished rolling up SCP-318-112. End log. Interviewer. Dr. F. Date. Undisclosed. Interview subject. SCP-318-1135. Formerly D-5- Original language. Modern French. Begin interview log. Dr. F. Please describe what you currently see, hear, feel, taste, and smell. SCP-3181-135. Expletive expunged. Dr. F. Please answer the question, 135. SCP-3181-135. Or you'll do what? Kill me again. Go ahead, you expletive expunged. Dr. F. As the subject is not complying with requests, I will now proceed to direct stimulus testing. D2. Please bring that cart over here. A cart is wheeled into the camera's field of view, 
containing a number of objects including sandpaper, a long barbecue lighter, a pair of scissors, a scalpel, graduated pipettes, several beakers containing liquids including water, ink, nitric acid, data expunged, and a roll of paper towels. Dr. F picks up a sheet of 100 grit sandpaper. SCP-3181-135 Ooh, a cart! Real scary. Sandpaper? What's that? Dr. F. Abrasion test. Dr. F proceeds to rub the sandpaper against SCP-3181-135 for approximately 5 seconds. SCP-3181-135 Ow! Hey! Expletive expunged. Dr. F. Please describe the sensation you just experienced. SCP-3181-135 Rub that expletive expunged. Sandpaper on your- Expletive expunged. And tell me how it feels. Dr. F returns sandpaper to cart, retrieves a pair of small alligator clips connected to an adjustable power source. Dr. F Subject compares sensation to application of sandpaper to genital area. SCP-3181-135 It's an expression, you sick! Expletive expunged. Dr. F attaches the alligator clips to opposite edges of SCP-3181-135. Note. In the interests of brevity, further stimulus testing is summarized in the stimulus testing log at the bottom of this document. End log. Interviewer. Dr. F. Date. Undisclosed. Interview subject. SCP-3181-138. Originally D-4... Original language. Interviewer's speech is modern English. Subject was illiterate and communicated through images. Possibly due to the subject's cognitive handicaps, these images were generally poorly rendered, resembling a child's drawing. Begin interview log. Dr. F. Greetings, 138. How are you feeling? SCP-3181-138. Smiley face image. Dr. F. Good, good. I'm going to perform some brief tests to see how you respond to different things. SCP-3181-138 Crude image of a smiling stick figure wearing a lab coat, carrying an Erlenmeyer flask in one hand, and what appears to be SCP-3181-138 in the other. Dr. F Yes, quite. Dr. F applies 0.5 milliliters of concentrated nitric acid near one corner of SCP-3181-138. SCP-3181-138 Chaotic scribbles, composed largely of jagged lines. Dr. F applies 0.5 milliliters of concentrated sodium hydroxide solution near one corner of SCP-3181-138. Dr. F May I have your reaction? SCP-3181-138 After approximately 15 second delay, an image of a human fist making an obscene gesture. End log. Stimulus testing log. Interviewer. Dr. F. Subject. SCP-3181-135. Stimulus applied. 100 grit sandpaper applied vigorously for 5 seconds. Subject response. Subject expressed significant discomfort and described sensation as corresponding to abrasion by sandpaper on bare skin. Interviewer. Dr. F. Subject. SCP-3181-135. Stimulus applied. Electrical stimulation, both direct and alternating current, at a variety of settings. Subject response. Subject initially reported no sensation, other than the pressure of the electrode clips. As current and voltage were raised, subject reported a mild tingling sensation, which was replaced with a burning sensation whenever the electrical stimulation significantly raised the temperature of the paper. Note, some of the applied shocks were severe enough to cause considerable pain in a living human. Apparently, the subject experiences sensations based on their effect upon paper rather than on how they would affect human flesh. Interviewer Dr. F Subject SCP-3181-135 
stimulus applied. Impact by steel hammer. Applied three times to the unrolled section of SCP-3181-135. Subject response. Subject reports brief feelings of pressure, but no significant discomfort. Interviewer. Dr. F. Subject. SCP-3181-135. Stimulus applied. Fire from a commercially produced butane barbecue lighter, applied briefly to one corner of the subject and extinguished promptly. Subject response. During stimulation, subject produced largely incoherent words, scattered haphazardly. Penmanship during this period was significantly degraded, rendering many words illegible. Afterward, subject reported continued pain, comparing the experience to having a body extremity set on fire. Note: While the level of discomfort could be useful in inducing compliance and defiant subjects, a less destructive method would be desirable. Interviewer: Dr. F. Subject: SCP-3181-135. Stimulus applied. Water: Two applications of 0.5 milliliters each, applied to area scorched in previous test and to a section of undamaged paper. Subject response. Subject reports a numbing sensation in the areas soaked by water, and words and drawings attempted in these areas are badly faded and distorted. As water dries, subject reports sensation returning, but that the burned area does not return to prior levels of discomfort. Note: An interesting result. Water appears to act as an anesthetic. Further testing is indicated. Interviewer. Dr. F. Subject: SCP-3181-135. Stimulus applied. Water. Subject completely saturated. Subject response. Subject becomes unresponsive and remains totally unresponsive under any stimuli after paper is thoroughly dried. Note: It would appear that SCP-3181-135 may have experienced the equivalent of death by anesthetic overdose. Interviewer: Dr. T. Subject: SCP-3181-136 and SCP-3181-140. Stimulus applied. Both subjects unrolled and placed in stands 1 meter apart with their writing surfaces facing each other. Subject response: Subjects engage in conversation with each other using characters approximately 2 centimeters tall. Addendum 3184 Requests to use SCP-318 to enable final debriefing of sufficiently recently deceased Foundation personnel are currently pending approval. Requests to use SCP-318 to interview test subjects killed by memetic SCPs is denied. Addendum 3185 Additional resources and personnel have been requested for the translation and cataloging of SCP-3181 as several recent interviews with SCP-3181 subjects have yielded useful information about certain SCP objects, including data expunged. Some interviews have also indicated the possible existence of previously unknown SCPs, one of which, SCP has since been located and contained. It should be noted that a number of the leads produced through interviews of SCP-3181 subjects have proven to be fabrications and all information obtained from SCP-3181 should be considered suspect. In spite of this, it is the belief of this researcher that there may be much to be gained in questioning all SCP-3181 about other potential SCP objects. Item Number SCP-319 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures SCP-319 is to be contained in place at Site-319, inside a hermetically sealed vacuum chamber 20 meters in diameter. The chamber housing SCP-319 must be insulated and the surface temperature controlled to present an absolutely uniform thermal gradient. SCP-319 is to rest on a platform with an active mass damping system, and the relative position of the housing for each instance of SCP-3191 and the diameter and position of SCP-3192 shall be continually monitored by high-precision laser rangefinders. 
Any deviations in the position of an instance of SCP-3191 by greater than 0.01% on any axis, or any change in size or position of SCP-3192 by greater than 0.001% is deemed a potential Goderdammerung scenario and a risk of a ZK-0 event. Foundation-wide initiation of Protocol Omega-319 is mandated in response to such an event until such a time as the positions of SCP-3191 are returned to optimal and SCP-3192 has ceased growth and movement. Any and all scientific investigation of SCP-319, SCP-3191, and SCP-3192 is authorized only with explicit O5 approval. Description SCP-319 is a mechanical device, constructed circa 1894, consisting primarily of 12 interlocking rings assembled in an 8-meter diameter spherical formation, allowing a clockwork mechanism, driven by electric motors, to rotate each ring separately on each axis. The purpose of the assembly appears to be the precise placement of 12 instances of SCP-3191 in relation to each other. The assembly has been frozen in its current configuration since its recovery, and current motion of instances of SCP-3191 have been almost solely due to tectonic disturbances and thermal expansion or contraction of the material comprising SCP-319. Precise measurements have determined microscopic variations in position due to gravitational tidal effects, but, to date, these have appeared to be within acceptable margins. SCP-3191 designates 12 anomalous mineral specimens, mounted on SCP-319. Each instance of SCP-3191 is nearly fully enclosed in a housing made of brass, copper and glass, with a 12mm opening pointed at the center of SCP-3192. Each housing for SCP-3191 is connected to heavy-duty electrical cabling that loops in a closed circuit, connecting each instance. Measurements indicate a constant 50 amperes of current in this circuit, despite no connection to an outside power source. SCP-3192 designates a bubble of vacuum 2.561 meters across, suspended inside SCP-319. SCP-3192 appears to be in a lower energy state than the surrounding universe. Because of the alteration of physical constants within this bubble, any matter and energy entering this bubble is annihilated, as their quantum structures are incompatible. Current theory predicts that the existence of SCP-3192 should catalyze a vacuum metastability event, resulting in the expansion of the boundary of SCP-3192 at the speed of light, bringing the vacuum state of the surrounding universe down to its lower energy state. This would represent a ZK-0 reality failure scenario. The universe would continue to exist but would not only cease to support life as we know it, but would fail to support chemistry as we know it. The expansion of SCP-3192 appears to be held in check by the precise positioning of SCP-3191 around it. This is supported by the fact that any recorded movement of SCP-3191 allows SCP-3192 to grow by varying amounts. Over the past 50 years, Vibrations and thermal expansion have moved SCP-3191 enough to allow SCP-3192 to enlarge by 0. Point meters in diameter, meaning that, at its current rate of expansion, in years, containment will fail, as the outer boundary of SCP-3192 intersects the innermost ring of SCP-319. Addendum Selected excerpts from the Journal of Sir Bandon Lawhead Smythe Recovered with SCP-319 August 12th, 1893 I found myself pleasantly surprised today when word arrived of a shipment from England. It appears my rival was as good as his word, living up to the terms of our wager. It seems that day, six months ago in the Explorers Club, Lord was not boasting of his accomplishments. Now, if I am not to be made a liar, I shall have to make good upon my own claims. August 15th, 1893. The specimens are exquisite, if one could rightly describe such unnerving carvings so. Ten to match the two I had already acquired. If Lord experienced half the travails acquiring these as I had my own, I owe the man an apology. 
even if it must be deferred until after I complete my own expedition. September 8th, 1893. Success! Long study of these odious cults has borne sweet fruit indeed. As I suspected, these stones are much more than primitive fetish objects for the worship of savages. The stories of their starborn origins and the exotic nature of the material told me that they were much more than that. Something in me finds it almost blasphemous that some ancient hand saw fit to defile such unique material by shaping it into such unclean geometries. November 12th, 1893. The solution was within my grasp all along. The stones, when lit, show a negative potential, and when shaded, positive. A simple copper enclosure, tipped on one end with a mercury tube, can induce a current in the stone, more than enough to power itself in the surrounding mechanism. January 10th, 1894. The workers have all left the cavern. The machine is complete. I will mount the stones today. Soon my feet will step beyond where anyone at the Explorers Club, even Lord could ever dream of going. January 30th, 1894. Today I have opened a door beyond our universe. My study of a dozen perverse cults allowed me to divine the precise positioning of the stones. Savages chipped these otherworldly relics into a dim likeness of their gods. Whereas I, Sir Bandon Lawhead Smythe, shall walk across the threshold to greet them. Once I have completed writing this entry, I shall don my protective suit, pass through the locks into the airless interior of the vault where the black door awaits me. When I next write in this journal, I shall have traveled farther than any other man on the face of this earth, including the good Lord Last entry. Journal ends. Item number. SCP-341 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures The Exhibition Hall of Reliquary Research and Containment Site 76 has SCP-341 on display for all research and command personnel to view. Description A collection of eleven brass and iron orreries found in a large storage room of a basement at Oxford comprise SCP-341. Each orrery is a rough-scale model of a different extrasolar star system, complete with planets, moons, and one or more suns in the center. A unique clockwork mechanism under each orrery allows the brass models of planets and moons to spin on axis, and rotate around each model of its parent stars. Testing dates each machine to be between 150 to 200 years old, but without any specific markings. Researchers have been unable to determine who created them. The orrery collection of SCP-341 was set to be released into the hands of a local museum, until an SCP astronomer with a piqued interest in the discovery recognized one of the orreries, SCP-341-E, as star system Upsilon Andromedae A, unique for being a solar twin of our own sun, with hot Jupiter-like planets. Further research has matched five of the eleven orreries with possible known extrasolar systems, including Beta Canum Venaticorum, 37 Geminorum, HD 98618, 18 Scorpii, one orrery, known as the Wheel of Doom amongst researchers, depicts a similar solar system very reminiscent of our own souls. Though the planets and sun themselves are neither near to scale nor space proportionately, the presence of seven major planets of our own system is fairly obvious, including Saturn and its rings, and the tilted side of Uranus. There are also five minor planets included beyond the orbit of Neptune. The Orrery is missing a model of Earth, and instead has a free moon roaming through a debris field, similar to the asteroid belt present between Mars and Jupiter. Item Number SCP-349 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-349 resembles a mundane graveyard and poses no apparent threat to the secrecy of Foundation operations or visitors to the site. Current containment protocols are limited to constant remote surveillance, the maintenance of a physical barrier to prevent casual unauthorized entry 
and the assignment of a response team to deal with vandalism or other threats to site integrity. Plans exist to expand the site as necessary to accommodate theorized growth. Description The artifact, designated SCP-3491, is a large granite tombstone, approximately 400 years old. The primary inscription reads Nicholas Flamel, followed by the dates 1376 to 1606. Underneath these inscriptions, there lies the legend, You Have Failed, in large capital letters. The tombstone is damaged and partially eroded, with several large cracks evident across its face. It was reported by a Foundation agent, an amateur genealogist in cemetery plot near Bath, England, on SCP-349 is a cemetery located within a desolate forest clearing three kilometers away. It was discovered after a thorough search of the area, where SCP-3491 was discovered. Because of allusions to restricted SCP-related information, said agent sealed the area and contacted the Foundation. The cemetery is surrounded by a black wrought iron fence with a single Gothic-style arched gate. Inside are small memorials to a variety of individuals from around the world and from throughout recorded history, and possibly earlier. The area is apparently maintained through unidentified means, as weed growth and natural erosion are both inhibited within the fence's confines. The epitaphs are brief and vicious, and the inscriber appears to eagerly claim responsibility for the death of each individual. In some cases, the inscriptions are particularly spiteful or vindictive, and seem to indicate personal animosity between the inscriber and the individual interred. See Survey 349B An analysis of historical records has been able to confirm the existence of some of the individuals mentioned, often by way of mythology. All substantiated historical personalities appear to have pursued or supposedly attained eternal life through a diversity of means. This does not appear to include those who were born with immortality, such as or races or species such as the data expunged. Among those identified are personages who are obscure, hidden, or only known to be unaging to certain esoteric orders, and whose existence is a secret to common knowledge. This includes who are known only in Foundation records. Furthermore, the site references a number of famous figures who apparently passed on much later than historically recorded, such as Christopher Columbus, Sir Francis Bacon, and Albert Heim. Finally, there exists a small group of buried individuals, for which we have no important files or mythology. A few have been tentatively identified as rich or eccentric figures of little renown from many places and times. Full information is available in Survey 349B. Individuals referenced within SCP-349 appear to have lived an average of 100 years longer than the mean lifespan at their time of death. The longest life recorded at the site as of this writing was, through careful study in comparison to ancient biblical gospels, theorized to be that of the Wandering Jew, 750 years. Based on this figure's supposed death, it is hypothesized that data expunged. Memorial materials and design, body preparation, burial style, religious symbolism, and inscription languages all appear to correspond to the era and culture in which the deceased was born. The oldest site identified is a carved pile of elephant bones, fit together with grooved notches and covered in incomprehensible pictographs and tribal marking. The earliest decipherable inscription is in Sumerian, on a simple rock dedicated to Kuaya the Heart Eater. You sold your clan into slavery and devoured the flesh of your family and received your reward. The corpses in most graves are in states of decay corresponding to their age, some of the older ones almost dust. Despite the variety of burial methods, close inspection reveals that a majority, roughly 90% of the plots, show scratch marks on the material that was blocking escape or signs of attempted tunneling to the surface. Nevertheless, each plot excavated so far has a corpse or set of bones afforded to it. The confirmed age of the various plots, the historical accuracy of its allusions, and the demonstrated familiarity of its keeper with classified Foundation knowledge of modern immortals 
suggests that SCP-349 is not a simple hoax. Containment has been established to facilitate study and to determine if contact can be made with the entity or entities responsible for it. Active intervention of these beings is theorized to have been responsible for as well as the demise of SCP-149-D while in Foundation custody during Data Expunged. The latter is one of two unique instances where an entirely preserved body was unearthed. Although the preservation seems to derive from properties the deceased displayed in life, rather than any condition imposed in death. The other instance is the remnants of Calothisosi of Britannica, a little-known mythological figure who could apparently withstand volleys of arrows and direct strikes with swords. In both cases, they were found with extreme terror on their faces, and their mouths were twisted as if screaming. Addendum 349A Deeper within the necropolis, excavators found a crypt holding a series of unrelated corpses placed together deliberately, apparently in a place of honor. Investigation into their identities, data expunged. Strict containment has been imposed to prevent any suggestion of this from reaching the public, as data expunged. Inscription Survey 349B Nicholas Flamel, 1376-1606 You have failed. Count Saint Germain, 1713 to 1901. Nice trick. Tithonus, negative 465 to negative 370. Exactly what you wanted. Sir Galahad, 1222 to damaged. Pure thy heart shall ever remain. Christopher Columbus, 1451 to 1520. A whole new world to explore. Sir Francis Bacon. 1561 to 1739. Think of the children. Herbert Heim, 1914 to 2008. A final solution. Classified Note 349C. The legitimate nature of SCP-349 is corroborated by the apparent familiarity of its keeper with classified intelligence concerning extranormal individuals. The following incidents are referenced on a grave marker within the site where possible interred remains have been positively identified as the individual mentioned. Data expunged. Individuals the Foundation has previously observed and registered as humans who have achieved immortality. Said individuals had either died bizarre deaths, or escaped Foundation surveillance and disappeared. The locations of the other are currently unknown. Have expressed through limited contact that they are being hunted and that they do not trust the Foundation to protect them. The identities of all data expunged. The serum apparently worked, and subjects displayed no adverse reactions until data expunged. Apparent paranoia persisted in data expunged. No corpses were recovered. SCP-149-D, a high-powered Keter-class human, who had attained apparent invulnerability and immortality after experimenting with springs and fountains located in designated SCP. Containment of his holding cell was breached on his 117th birthday, and SCP-149-D was never recovered, presumed at the time to be escaped and at large. DNA recovered from the intact body was verified to be that of SCP-149-D. Item Number SCP-361 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-361 is to be kept in a standard artifact containment unit in Site-19's High Value Wing. SCP-361 is to be kept in a cool and dry environment to prevent damage to the aged metal it is composed of and thoroughly cleaned after each use. Description SCP-361 is a bronze Etruscan artifact in the shape of a sheep's liver. SCP-361 is covered in the names of Etruscan gods and instructions for various religious rites, and is believed to have served as a tool for practicing haruspicy, divination using animal organs. SCP-361 bears a strong resemblance to the non-anomalous artifact known as the Liver of Piacenza with which it was originally found during the late 19th century. Both artifacts date to the 2nd and 3rd century BCE, to the province of Piacenza, Italy. SCP-361's anomalous properties manifest if it comes into contact with the sheep's liver, 
removed no more than three hours before interacting with SCP-361. When such contact is made, SCP-361 will vocalize, in a language and tone appropriate to the one introducing the liver to it, a set of instructions meant to achieve contact with one of the gods or spirits depicted in the writings covering it, through a service it refers to as Harusko. If these instructions are performed correctly within a period of 30 seconds, SCP-361 will provide a new set of instructions. SCP-361's instructions will grow increasingly convoluted and or nonsensical until becoming almost impossible to perform under the given time limit. Failure to follow an instruction will cause SCP-361 to become inactive for a period of 24 hours. Test Log SCP-361 Test 361-A Stage 1 A sheep's liver is introduced to SCP-361 Vocalization Welcome to Harris Co. Your sacrifice is very important to us. For Tinia the Thunderer, please perform a horizontal incision on the offering. For Ida of the Underworld, please perform a vertical incision. For Maris, lightly cover your offering with the ash of a dead warrior related to you by blood. Stage 2 A horizontal incision is made. Vocalization You have selected Tinia. For your weekly meteorological divination, please singe your offering over an open flame for five seconds. For warning bolts, please place a green olive on the altar. For beseechments and beneficial interventions, please attach a written consent from the consulate gods. For catastrophes, please remove the head of an adult ox and hold. Stage 3 The liver is singed over an open flame. Vocalization you have selected weekly meteorological divination. For your local forecast, please perform the seven sacred rites of Tinia while avoiding the anger of the mildew spirits. For forecasts for other areas, please perform the rites upon a boat of three masts or more. For a marital forecast, please consult with your local priestess of Uni. Stage 4 Researchers were unable to comply with the instructions in the given time frame. Vocalization no input was received. This sacrifice will be disconnected. Thank you for using Harris Co., Rasna's number one divination and deistic petition service for more than 2,000 years. The gods are looking forward to your next call. SCP-361 enters inactive state. Addendum SCP-361-A In order to examine the limits of SCP-361's ability to alter the language and tone it uses to interact with its user, a subject with a similar cultural origin to SCP-361 was required. For that purpose, a request for interaction between SCP-361 and SCP-1510, the persona of which originates from the same general area and time period, was made and accepted. Test 361B Stage 1 Subject D-1510104 Wearing SCP-1510 introduces a sheep's liver to SCP-361. Vocalization SCP-361 vocalizes in classical Latin, the language spoken by SCP-15101. The instruction is translated to, Son of Romulus, speak the words thy father taught you, and your watcher will speak, his words carried by our spirit. Stage 2 SCP-15101 chants several phrases in Latin, later identified as an oath to Mars Gradivus. Vocalization SCP-361's instruction is translated to place the aspect of your watcher at his feet, so he might see your altered form. Stage 3 SCP-15101 requests an open flame. He is given a camping gas lamp. SCP-1510 places the lit gas lamp at the feet of the table SCP-361 is placed on. Vocalization SCP-361's instruction is translated to Speak the duty of your watcher, so he might judge your worthiness. Stage 4 SCP-15101 speaks a Latin phrase, later identified as Mars Gradivus's Oath. To guard, preserve, and protect the state, the peace, and the senate. 
Vocalization. SCP-361's instruction is translated to Show your watcher that you do not stand alone. Does he who guards your left carry with him your watcher's conviction? Stage 5. SCP-15101 requests one of the supervising researchers to enter the room and touch SCP-361. Request granted. Vocalization. SCP-361 speaks in a different voice, still in classical Latin. Courage, Publius. This too shall pass. When Rust claims your soul at last, Valor will make you into Aeneas and carry you beyond these shores to rest among your fathers. The voice was later identified by SCP-15101 as the voice of the Persona's father. SCP-361 enters an active state. Item number SCP-368 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-368 has not yet warranted any need for containment. Though it has the movement patterns and behavior common to a normal bird, neither it nor any of its copies have shown any desire to migrate from the offices in which they are stored. Description SCP-368 is an animate origami crane folded from ornate heavy stock paper. Left to its own devices, it will perch, preen, fly from platform to platform, groom, and occasionally construct a makeshift nest out of nearby office supplies. It responds to human touch affectionately, much as a domesticated bird would. The item's demeanor is, on the whole, friendly, and it has been observed to perch on the shoulders of various SCP personnel. Though the item needs no source of nourishment, it appears to sleep at night, in that it places its head under its wing. Studying the physical properties of SCP-368 has proven difficult. The item seems to interpret attempts to capture or contain it as a game, and has displayed considerable agility and resourcefulness in evading the most focused attempts at containment. How SCP-368 stays airborne and maintains its stability while airborne are still not known. History SCP-368 was discovered in an office building in Japan in 19... Now employed as 14-1158, a former employee at the aforementioned building found the item in a closet full of office supplies. Upon discovery of SCP-368, 14-1158 managed to gain its trust in order to move it to a more secure location. Psychological evaluations of 14-1158 indicated her to be of sufficient mental stability and acuity to warrant a position within the SCP organization. Cross SCP Warnings It is recommended that SCP-368 be isolated from SCP-529 and SCP-530, as contact will almost certainly alarm all three SCPs. Addendum 022 On date undisclosed, while housed in Research Sector 15, SCP-368 began displaying unusual behavior. Instead of its normal routine of human interaction, grooming, and play, it began hovering over a photocopier, flattening itself whenever SCP personnel approached. Dr. placed SCP-368 into the photocopier and made a copy, upon which another sheet of paper of identical pattern but different hue emerged from the copier and promptly folded itself into a shape mimicking that of the original. SCP-368 in the new specimen, referred to as SCP-368-Alpha, resumed usual behavior. Since then, SCP-368 has displayed similar behavior at intervals varying between two and four years, while the copies have shown no such behavior. Though initially Overseer O disallowed any employee from aiding in the reproduction of SCP-368, and Dr. was reprimanded for his action, remarkably high employee morale at Research Sector 15 led to the introduction of the progeny of SCP-368 at further SCP facilities. Item Number SCP-373 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-373 is to be kept in a containment locker at Site-38. Research into SCP-373 and SCP-373-A iterations is to be carried out by authorized personnel. Grounds for immediate revocations of testing privileges include, but are not limited to, 
recent loss of loved ones, testing privileges suspended for five years, any history of abuse or inability to follow orders as per containment procedures for other SCPs, testing privileges revoked permanently, any past association with paranormal research or investigative groups, testing privileges revoked until approval given by site director, or any unusual or persistent interest or obsession with SCP-373. Testing privileges revoked permanently. Note from head researcher The potential implications of this device for both SCP-373-A entities and their former loved ones require a certain degree of composure with regard to its use. Quite frankly, we may be creating these beings rather than channeling them. Personnel unable to react responsibly with that degree of power are not to be allowed access. Note from head researcher Testing with D-Class personnel to be carried out as per Addendum 3734. For maximum efficiency in gathering intelligence regarding SCP-373-A entities, all records used with SCP-373 should be 33.5 RPM vinyl albums, with lyric-heavy songs or spoken word tracks, audiobooks, comedy albums, and other principally speech-based records are encouraged. Principally instrumental or orchestral music, is forbidden. Description SCP-373 is an antique disc phonograph player. Markings on the machine indicate it was built in 19... An additional label indicates that the device was modified in late 1940 at a facility called Laboratories, Inc. The device is composed of a crank-operated turntable embedded in a wooden case, a tone arm with an aluminum stylus, and a slightly tarnished silver horn. SCP-373 appears to have the ability to modify the audio of any record player on it according to particular patterns. Specifically, research has demonstrated that approximately every fourth word or phrase will be altered from the originally recorded song or monologue. These new words can be organized sequentially to reveal what appear to be messages or statements from a series of unknown entities. These entities have been named SCP-373-AX with X to be replaced with a numerical identification as entities are discovered. The entity is able to communicate for the duration of each instance of the playing of the record. Upon the next playing of the same record, the same entity will be speaking, but will claim not to recall the previous conversation. Due to the stilted nature of the communication, it is rare for the entities to communicate any significant amount of information to Foundation researchers before the end of the record. However, Research has demonstrated that two-way communication is possible by lifting the needle from the record while it spins and speaking into the horn. Any attempt at useful communication requires both parties speak while the record spins at the speed at which optimal playback was intended. All SCP-373-A entities report that speaking into the horn with the record slowed or stopped results in a high-pitched squeal for the entity, and vice versa. Testing with anomalies such as SCP-043 and SCP-1668 did not initially produce data. However, analysis of audio taken during testing has shown the presence of at least two distinct breathing patterns being broadcast from SCP-373. Further scheduled testing is currently under consideration. Addendum 3731 Abridged Log of SCP-373-A Entities Entity SCP-373-A3 Run-through number 1 Record Painkiller by Judas Priest Notes An early attempt at scientific analysis of the phenomenon, both the choice of music and questions were largely arbitrary. Two-way communication not yet understood. Full lyrical output is included below to demonstrate effect. All future entries will include only relevant utterances. Results Playing of track 1, Painkiller, resulted in the following lyrical output. Faster than a hello, terrifying scream. Enraged hello, full of anger. Who's half man and there, machine. Rides the metal can, breathing smoke and anybody. Closing in with here, soaring high. He is me, painkiller. This is is painkiller. Planets devastated. Mankind's this. It's knees. 
A savior what? From out the skies. Hell, answer to there is. Through boiling clouds, I thunder. Blasting bolts don't steal. Evil's going under, no, wheels. He is what? Painkiller. This is I've painkiller. Faster than a dun, bullet. Louder than a please, bomb. Chromium plated, it's metal. Brighter than a so, suns. Flying high on dark. Stronger free and and. Nevermore encaptured. Cold. Been brought back here. The grave. Entity. SCP-373-A3. Run through. Eight. Record. Painkiller by Judas Priest. Notes. First consistent and notable demonstration of two-way communicative potential. Communication redacted to relevant utterances for convenience. Result. The following interview was carried out by researcher Kim with entity SCP-373-A3. Kim. Speaking as record begins. Needle up. Hello. Please try to stay calm. You've had an accident, and we are working to save you. Can you tell us your name? SCP-373-A3. Hello. Oh, thank goodness. I thought I had died. Kim, could you please tell us your name? SCP-373-A3. My name is Mary Turner. I had a dream. I thought they hanged. Kim, you're okay, Mary. Can you tell me what you see? SCP-373-A3. All dark. No light. Just your voice. Please help. Kim, we're very close to getting you out. Just hold on tight. Can you tell me where you live and what day it is? SCP-373-A3. Valdosta in Folsom County. Is my baby okay? Kim, it's fine, ma'am. Can you tell me what year it is? SCP-373-A3. What you mean? It's 1918. The record ends. Flipping the record results in the conversation beginning again, as in all other tests. Entity number. SCP-373-A24. Run through. Two. Record. Item Pi 2. Notes. Item Pi 2 is a vinyl record pressed by Site 38 for testing purposes, consisting of a rapid, though clearly audible, reading of Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities. The speed at which the book is read allows for approximately 720 words per minute, increasing the potential conversational ability of the ensuing SCP-373-A entity. Result. The following is the interview between researcher Kim and SCP-373-A24. Kim. Hello. There's been an accident. We're trying to get you out, but we need you to remain calm. Can you tell us what the last thing is that you remember? SCP-373-A24. Harry. Is that you? Kim. I'm sorry. I can't understand you. What is the last thing you were doing? SCP-373-A24. Harry. It's me. It's Susan. The car skidded on the ice. Where are you? Kim. Appearing distressed. Wait. Susan. Susan? Oh my god. Susan. Are you in here? Assistant Researcher Lucas. Harry. We can't tell them. Kim. That's her, Joey. That's my wife in there. To SCP-373. Sweetie, it's me. Oh god, you've been gone for almost a year, but you're back now. Lucas. Security, we need security in here. He's losing it. Attempts to restrain researcher Kim. Kim. Knocking down Lucas. Grabbing SCP-373's horn. Shaking. I'm going to get you out of there. Just wait. Several agents enter the room and drag researcher Kim out by force, knocking SCP-373 to the ground in the process. Experiment ends. 
Damage to SCP-373 repaired. Researcher Lucas's injuries were treated. Researcher Kim's attack against Foundation agents attempting to restrain him led to his termination. Addendum 3732 SCP-373 entities have been showing a greater tendency to present themselves as relatives or close friends of Foundation personnel in the last two months. This has begun to take place in spite of deliberate efforts to choose records at random. Statistical probability suggests it to be highly unlikely that we have been selecting these particular individuals without some influence on the part of SCP-373. Requesting a halt to testing until a pattern can be discerned. Researcher Lucas Addendum 3733 Request approved Head Researcher Addendum 3734 Four different researchers have been caught over the last three weeks attempting to access SCP-373 for personal purposes. In one instance, a researcher successfully began to use a record already believed to contain one SCP-373-A entity, at which point he was able to communicate with his deceased daughter. Present opinion among Site-38 Command is that SCP-373 is deliberately manipulating its users into emotional distress. Additionally, given the disregard for security protocols being shown now by experienced Foundation researchers, in the face of SCP-373, we are forced to conclude that the object becomes increasingly determined to force individuals to use it as time passes between usage, much in the way predators become increasingly desperate as time passes after feeding. Suggesting that D-Class personnel be allowed to use SCP-373 twice weekly in order to prevent further deterioration of conditions here. Researcher Lucas Addendum 3735 Request approved Head Researcher Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.